Well, hello everybody out there. It's Jeff from Home Renovision. In today's video, we are talking about DIY fixer uppers. That's right. We're not looking for money pits and we've gonna go through some information today. It's gonna help you look to find a house. I know things are crazy out there. Interest rates are gone through the roof. One of the things you can do when you've got huge interest rates is don't get a mortgage. Buy something dirt cheap. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of different reasons why you're looking at fixer uppers. Let me just go through a couple here. One is you inherited a home and it's a fixer upper. You get a lot of people on the channel who, you know, their parents or their grandparents have left them a property and they lived in it all their life and never made any upgrades. Not uncommon. And so you've inherited a fixer upper. And the question is, is that house worth it to put the time and energy in to fix it up? So we're going to help you walk through that a little bit today. Today so that you can know if it's something you should sell or something that you should invest in. Second is entry level housing. If you're young and you're in the market and you're like, how do I get a place that I can afford? How do I get a house that has a mortgage for less than 100,000 so I can have a little disposable income left over to then invest in the house and build my own ROI? We'll talk about that as well. And we're also going to talk about ROI as a rule because there's multiple different kinds of investors. Some people are watching this channel just because you know you got the skills and the time and the ability to buy an older house by the dog in the neighborhood, flip it. I don't want you to be in flippers. I want you to be renovators, but you can buy it and then sell it. In a lot of cases, you got to hold that for a year or so, depending on where you live. There's different rules. Make sure whenever I give you advice, you guys check out the rules for where you live because the rules are different everywhere. There's no such thing as one size fits all. Every state, every county, every province, every city has their own freaking rules. And it is very convoluted, shall we say, to figure out where and what rules to follow. So I give you the best advice that I can based on that middle of the road, what's usually generally acceptable, what the builders are doing. I try to make it so that it's somewhat universal, but it's not always that way. So make sure you always check with the local building office before moving forward with the project. Having said that, so that I don't get sued, let's move into this. Um, let's deal with inherited first. When you're dealing with an inherited house, generally speaking, you're dealing with older houses. All right, now here's the deal. If you got a house that's pre-1974, we're going to call that as our line in the sand. 1974, that's when we had a building code. Well, in the United States, the Canadian building code and the American building code came together during that 70s, 80s era. That's generally when things kind of calmed down and leveled out and everybody kind of realized, hey, there's a better way to do this. If we all did the same thing, we can make more money because we don't have 8 million options for materials and processes and procedures. And the more science we got involved with, the more we wanted to streamline it because we started to realize that we were building things that were in constant conflict with each other as far as our building systems. Up until about the 30s and 40s, everything was just wood. Just wood. Throw wood at it. If it's if you need it, you need you throw wood in it. Wood walls, wood studs, wood outside, wood inside, wood ceilings, wood subfloor, wood on wood on wood, and then wood floors. Wood was everything, right? And then we started going, well, that's a lot of bloody wood. How are we going to build faster? So they started to make thinner wood and, and less wood and only one layer of wood. And, and then, you know, the science started to get into it as population started to boom. How do we build faster? How do we get smarter about everything? So when you're looking at a fixer upper, you need to understand as a consumer what year you're buying your house and what era of construction technology that was. Understand that the age of the house means a lot. So when you're looking at a house, let's just go pretend because I'm shopping for a house right now too. I'm in the looking for a, a renovation house, right? I'm looking for the dog of the neighborhood. It doesn't mean I'm looking like pre-1980, but it means I'm looking for the dog. So here we go. We're going down the street. We find a house. Okay. First of all, make sure that they're not pricing that house based on square footage, location. They're ignoring the fact that everything needs to be redone. Like seriously, do you know that when we build a house, we expect all of our mechanical systems to last about 50 years. Engineers put a stamp on something saying that's a 50 year build. After 50 years, they have zero expectation that it's going to last another day. Everything else is on borrowed time. Now, generally with plumbing, we know we can squeeze 70, maybe even 100 years, depending on the conditions and the materials. But 50 years is, the, is that's when you should be starting to plan upgrades. So let's take a look back. We're talking about, well, it's uh, 1980 was 43 years ago. And for everybody who's my age, what the heck are you talking about? I was in grade five. Really, that was 43 years ago. 1980 is pretty much post, you know, a couple years before that, but post asbestos. That was really the last major hurdle in building material that was toxic was asbestos. So everything before 1980, and we're talking about 43 years ago, has issues with toxicity. If you can find something that's in the 1980 range, you're going to be at least safe with any renovation. You don't have to worry about toxicity, asbestos, and lead, and all that other kind of junk. 1980 is going to still be a, a situation where the house is going to be valued as it doesn't need all the changes. It doesn't need plumbing. It doesn't need electrical. Okay, It's still going to be up to par. It's not currently up to code, but it was a code when it was built, and it's still considered the standard of the day. So you're going to pay top dollar for that sucker. 
No one's giving you a discount. When you go back to 1960, 1970, check your comparables in the neighborhood. Make sure they're not charging the same square footage for the same lot of, of, a, of a totally different generation home for the same dollar. Just because it looks pretty, just because a flipper went in, made everything gray, bought all the Home Depot fixtures and stuck them on the ceiling, put in the nice new vinyl floor, doesn't mean it's a brand new house. When your mechanical gets 50 years old, you've got to open up your interior walls and change your electrical. You've got to change your plumbing. you got to change your HVAC. Even the HVAC, more than 50 years ago, they didn't have a sweet clue what they were doing. They just had this large furnace. They were shoving coal in it. God only knows. They had pipes running through the house. They didn't know anything about cold air return. They hadn't done any science. Nowadays, you got to have a license to put in ductwork because it's all so science driven. The pushing and the pulling of the air to make sure that the air quality stays relatively decent and that the house is consistent temperature throughout the different zones. Let's just go, hey, we're going to go buy 1930. 1930, here's your issues, okay? One foundation. They didn't really understand foundations. They didn't understand soil testing. They didn't understand the difference in soil all the way up and down the coast. You go over that old, you're looking east coast. A lot of the houses that were built back in then, the foundation walls were stronger than the interior walls. So everything sags. The staircase has got a slant. The floor joists were all put together with nails or no joist hangers. Nothing was rest resting on top of something for structural. So everything starts to just slowly collapse, bending on the nails. It will last 200 years with character and charm. But really what it is, it's a slow degradation of the structure of the house falling apart. What we can do as renovators, we can go in and we can stop the degradation. We can add joist hangers. We can put in some structural elements so it doesn't get any worse. But we can't ever really salvage it because you're not going to lift the house back up and put it back where it came from. It's a problem. So HVAC is a big issue because you have that framing issue and the HVAC would go back in those days and they'd cut through the joists. They didn't drill holes. If it was in the way, they cut, cut it out of the way because everything had so much bloody wood. There was strapping on top, strapping underneath, strapping, strapping, lath. Even if you cut a joist right out of the way, the floor was just a trampoline of woods and nails and it didn't make a difference. So the HVAC guys had no rules you will find that they would just cut big square chunks. They didn't have hole saws. They'd run a duck. They didn't care. The plumbers were the same thing. By the time you finished plumbing and HVAC at a bathroom, there was nothing left of the floor joist package, but that's okay because we use wood clad on the ceilings and wood hardwood floors on top and everything kind of held together. I would suggest that if you're looking for good value and you want to buy a dog and you're looking for that DIY opportunity, don't go back that far in history. It's not necessary. What you can do is you can start looking at the 60s. In the 60s, we moved to two by 10 floor joists away from two by eight, which is really important. In the 60s, we went to a one inch thick subfloor. It was a board, like one by six, one by eight, alternating sizes even on a 45 degree angle. Okay. That's a really good subfloor. Now it was only done with nails. So you're going to have to screw that down. So you got to change all the floors in the house if you go to the 60s. That's fine. Not a big deal, right? Your electrical is a nightmare. You may not even have a ground. And if it does, the wire is so old, you risk fire, you're better to just rewire. And the electrical code back in the day was absolute mess. And even electricians, you know, they, they, they would put a wire and they had to put a staple on it and they'd hammer that staple so tight to pinch that wire so it wouldn't move because it's safe if it's not going to move, but it would create hot spots and start fires. It was a mess. And nowadays we have different code requirements for electrical and kitchens. All right. So if you're going to renovate a house, you're going to have to update the kitchen. Make sure they at least have a hundred amp breaker service not fuses. If you got a 100 amp service, you're going to be all right because modern code allows us to run a 12 2 wire to kitchen plugs now and service both plugs instead of two 14 2 dedicated circuits, which used to totally take up the whole panel. And that would, that would really hurt because you go to renovate and you're like, there's no room left for anything. So what we're looking at is understand the progression in time. If your foundation is good, how do you know? Look at the roof. Check out the roof. If it's straight along the horizon line, your foundation's good. Okay. If it has a bit of a bow in it, it means everything's collapsing in the middle. Very important to check. Now, when you get into the 60s, you start getting a truss construction and the roof line looks great and the inside of the house is falling apart. And let's say if you're on a crawl space, it can be falling apart. That's a bad sign. Okay. One key I'm going to give you right now. When you go to get your house inspection, don't get the house inspector that the real estate suggests. They're working in cahoots. Real estate agent has a house inspector and it's kind of understood don't screw this sale up on me. So go find your own house inspector, do some research, get somebody who's going to give you independent advice about what's going on in the house. They'll find all the little nicks and nabs and you can prioritize whether or not this is an investment for you. Inherited homes, get yourself an inspector right away. First thing you do, don't even think about it. Get an inspector, have them make a list. A is the water staying out when it rains. B is there anything inherently dangerous or potentially about ready to destroy the house, fire, flood, or otherwise? What's the age of the hot water tank? Those can actually blow up 
and fail. So don't consider the hot water tank as a forever appliance. It's not. It's temporary. You got to manage those. Okay. C, do you have soft spots or rotting or termites? Uh, a lot of older houses, if you leave if you leave the, the, the foliage, the bushes growing up against the house, right? All the, all the vapor that comes from breathing. And you know what happens. If you're gone camping, you wake up in the morning, you're soaking wet because you had the doors zipped up on the tent window and the door. The vapor coming out of your body couldn't escape. So you're soaking wet, even with the ground sheet. That's going on in your house all the time. So when you have bushes up against your wall, that wall assembly is supposed to be allowing vapor to pass through and dry out. But when you got a bush on there, it holds moisture in that wall so it doesn't work. And that wall stays wet all the time. And wet wood attracts bugs and bugs eat the wood and then the wood isn't holding up the house and so on and so on. So it's good to know. Make sure that if you're buying an old fixer upper, you're fixing the house and you're not getting into too much landscaping. Is what I'm saying. Too many bushes means extra work. You're going to have surprises you don't see coming and you can avoid that by a big problem. For return on investment, this is the other issue. Make sure the house you buy, just because it's cheap, doesn't mean it's good return on investment. Now here on, on our channel, I like to preach this. If you put in a dollar, you should be getting back three more plus that original dollar. So you should be, one turns into four. So 10,000 into a house should make you 40 grand. There are lots of neighborhoods out there that are attractive. You go on Zillow and, and you pop in and you go, hey, Alabama looks real attractive. You know, I can get a house for 60,000 bucks. Yeah, um, consider the, the crime in that neighborhood. Consider the return investment. You put in 40, are you gonna get make that house worth 100? Or are you gonna just make it worth 70 or 75? Are you getting four to one or are you getting one to one? Real estate is not a, a national thing, it's a regional thing. So you gotta make sure that you are playing a regional game. Where do you wanna be working? Is it close to Home Depot or my other suppliers that you're gonna be using, right? Think about your travel time, think about all these different things. When it all comes down to it, when all is said and done, if you find a house that has a good roof and it's been dry and stayed dry, and then you can manage your expectation for how old the mechanical is, my best advice to everybody out there is find a house. If you're new into DIY and you want to do some renovations or remodeling, buy something from 1975, 1976. Okay, there's tons of them out there. They need all the remodeling done. And remodeling is where the money is. Your foundation's good. Your electrical's still good. Your plumbing's still good. Okay, your HVAC is, it's not amazing. But without upgrading your major mechanical systems, you can pretty much just do your fixtures and your flooring and your finishings. That's where the money is for a return on investment. And if you're gonna get something older, make sure that you make an adjustment on the value of that home before you buy it. Do not pay for mechanical systems that need to be replaced. Take 10,000 for plumbing, 10,000 for electrical, and 10 or 15 for the HVAC, and have them take that off the sale of that home if it's comparable to a house of the same size in the same neighborhood from 1975 or 1980. You're not getting the same house. And remember, depending where you live, you might need insulation. And the older the house, the lousier the insulation. It might have started out as an R13, but a lot of homes in the 1950s and 60s, what's in that wall now is down to a, about an R8. So that's there to consider as well. Do you have to get new windows? There's another big one. Now, if you have to open up all your interior walls to change your mechanical, and you got to open up all your exterior walls to change your insulation, and you got to change all your windows and doors, and you got termites, and you need a new roof, might I suggest that that's not a DIY fixer-upper, okay? That's a money pit. And there is a huge difference between a house that needs to be brought back to life and a house that's been neglected to the point where it's decayed faster than it should have. So try to manage your expectations. Don't fall into the trap of buying something that's got all these problems with moisture, okay? and bugs and rot and mold. Find something that's just outdated and a little ugly. And it's okay if somebody squatted in it or they had 45 cats. All that kind of stuff can be remediated, no problem. Make sure she's solid as a rock. You're going to be okay.